Hi, I'm Joseph Feraldi. I want to thank you for joining us here at Bayside Chapel Online. Our prayer is that today's service will be a blessing to you, that it will encourage you in your journey with Jesus Christ, and it will help you to see all that God has in store for you. We would love to hear from you on how God is using this ministry to bless you, and we'd love the opportunity to pray for you. Just send us an email at amen at baysidechapel.org. Remember that you can stay in touch with us at any time. Just visit the App Store and search for our app at Bayside Chapel of NJ. Also, if God is using this ministry to bless you, we'd like to give you the opportunity to partner with us financially. Simply go online to BaysideChapel.org or use the Bayside Chapel app and choose whatever option works best for you. Enjoy today's message. Good morning. For those of you that are watching online or maybe here and uh, don't know uh, the staff here at Bayside, I'm uh, Joe Feraldi. I'm the assistant pastor. We're glad you're joining us online. We're glad you're here with us. Uh, our senior pastor, Pastor Dave, is in the Chicago area. The family has gathered out there. Pastor Dave's sister had passed away. Um, gee, I'm trying to think now when it was uh, earlier this week. So please do keep the Ritter family in your prayers. Um, again, we're glad you're here. And uh, we're going to get to see something kind of cool today. If, if you're visiting for the first time, this is not going to be normal. Of course, normal and Bayside are two words that usually don't go together anyway. But this is going to be really, really cool. You know, we just got done singing about the faithfulness of God. And you can't, you can't really separate the, the concept of faithfulness from the idea of taking somebody at their word. If someone's faithful, you can take them at their word. Well, you and I are going to have an opportunity to see a thread, a bunch of threads that run through the scriptures. Think of it as a scarlet thread, like out at Rahab's window. And that thread is the Lord Jesus Christ. And so we are going to have the opportunity to participate in and observe the Seder and to see the Lord Jesus Christ in it and to see this incredible connection between what we call the Old Testament and the New Testament. And to do that, we have a very special guest. His name is David Brickner. He is the executive director at, of Jews for Jesus. We're looking forward, brother, to seeing what the Lord's going to do through you again this service. Would you please welcome our brother, David Brickner? Shalom. Uh, thank you. Well, thank you, Pastor Joe. Shalom. Shalom. Yeah, I feel at home. It's great to hear the language of heaven spoken so loudly. <laughs> Shalom is a Hebrew word. It means peace. It also means hello. It also means goodbye. Some people take that to mean that we Jews don't know whether we're coming or we're going. But it is in the Shalom of God, the peace that we find in our Lord Jesus, that I greet you today. And some of you may wonder what uh, Jews for Jesus is all about. It sounds like a contradiction in terms. Anything you know about Jewish people, they're not believing in Jesus, right? Jews for Jesus sounds like vegetarians for meat. You know? <laughs> but think about it. Jesus himself is a Jew, right? Right? All, all the disciples, Peter, James, John, they were Jews. All the writers of the New Testament, with the impossible exception of Luke... We're Jewish, but Luke was a doctor, so who knows? <laughs> Back in the beginning, believing in Jesus was a Jewish thing to do. As a matter of fact, when the first Gentile wanted to believe in him, oh, evaded, we have problems. Never before had a Gentile wanted to believe in the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob without first becoming a proselyte or a convert to Judaism. And so in the book of Acts, when God Corne told us that Cornelius had come to believe in Jesus, this was something completely different. We didn't know what to do with the guy, so we held the first church council. You can read about it in Acts chapter 16. The first church council was held to resolve this burning question. What do we do with the Gentiles for Jesus? <laughs> and thankfully God told us it was good. It was an okay thing. It was part of his plan from the beginning. And, and we got so excited about that good news, we sent out some of our best missionaries to you. We sent Paul and Silas and Barnabas, and well, they did such a good job. There were many more Gentiles for Jesus than there were Jews for Jesus. 
But that too was part of God's plan because he wanted to do what Paul talks about, breaking down the middle wall of partition, dividing Jews from Gentiles and making us one new person in the body of Christ. So we are one in him. Amen? Amen. But you know, because of that, you share with me in a rich heritage, the heritage of the people of Israel. And all that God did to reveal himself through the fathers and through the prophets and and through the festivals of Israel, that's your heritage too in the Messiah. And today we're going to look at one beautiful aspect of that heritage in the story of Christ in the Passover. Of course, Passover is the story of God's deliverance of the Jewish people from bondage and slavery in Egypt thousands of years ago. But as we look more closely at this ancient festival, you're going to see that God in redeeming Israel from Egypt wove into the very fabric of that story a picture of a far greater redemption of all the world from the Egypt of sin through our Passover lamb, who is Jesus the Messiah. So travel back with me in time to that first Passover story which we find in the book of Exodus. Exodus chapter 12 and we'll be reading verses 5 through 8 and 11 through 15. Now if you remember at this time Israel was in bondage. We were enslaved in Egypt and God promised he was going to redeem us. And so he raised up Moses. He sent Moses to the Pharaoh of Egypt to say, Pharaoh, let my people go. But Pharaoh wasn't willing to listen. So God had to persuade Pharaoh to listen. God can be very persuasive when he wants to be. He persuaded Pharaoh to listen by sending a series of plagues on the land of Egypt. You remember the story. There were 10 plagues in all. Now, the Jewish people were living in a section of Egypt called Goshen, and they were automatically exempt from the first nine of those 10 plagues. For example, the Bible tells us when darkness fell across the land of Egypt as a plague from the Lord, there was nevertheless light in Goshen where the Jewish people were living. Or when God struck the cattle of the Egyptians with a plague, the cattle of the Israelites were spared. But no one was spared from that tenth plague, the worst plague, the death of the firstborn in in Egypt. And in order that plague should not fall upon the Jewish people, they had to do something very special. God commanded that they take a lamb, one lamb for each family. And that's where we pick up the story now, Exodus 12 and verse 5. Exodus 12, verse 5. Let's see. Your lamb shall be without blemish, a male, a year old. You may take it from the sheep or from the goats, and you shall keep it up until the 14th day of this month, when the whole assembly of of the congregation of Israel shall kill their lambs at twilight. Then they shall take some of the blood and put it on the two doorposts and on the lintel of the houses in which they eat it. They shall eat the flesh that night roasted on the fire with unleavened bread and bitter herbs they shall eat it. Now verse 11, in this manner you shall eat it, with your belt fastened, your sandals on your feet, and your staff in your hand, and you shall eat it in haste, it is the Lord's Passover. For I will pass through the land of Egypt that night, and I will strike all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both men and beast, and on all the gods of Egypt I will execute judgments, I am the Lord." The blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you. And no plague will befall you to destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. This day shall be for you a memorial day. And you shall keep it as a feast to the Lord throughout your generations. As a statute forever, you shall keep it as a feast. Seven days you shall eat unleavened bread. On the first day you shall remove leaven out of your houses, for if anyone eats what is leavened from the first day until the seventh day, that person shall be cut off from Israel. So that's the historical institution of the Passover. We know then that the first Passover was celebrated on the night of the tenth plague way back in the land of Egypt. But as we also read, God commanded Israel to continue to celebrate Passover as a lasting ordinance. And so throughout our history, as we celebrated, there were various symbols and traditions added to the observance to remind us of that first Passover back in the land of Egypt. 
so that by the time Jesus and his disciples were celebrating Passover, all but two of the items that you see on the table this morning were already incorporated into that Passover observance. And of course, the most significant Passover observance that Jesus and his disciples commemorated was that one in the upper room in Jerusalem. The Last Supper was a Passover. So then how much more significant does this festival come to be for us who are followers of Jesus in light of all that he said and did on that night he was betrayed? And of course, we're celebrating Passover every year Uh, in Jewish homes around the world. And this year, the first night of the Passover is the night before Palm Sunday. And there's a tremendous amount of preparation that goes into the celebration of the Passover. You might remember from the gospel accounts that Jesus even sent Peter and John ahead of him into the city of Jerusalem saying, go prepare the Passover that we may eat. And this preparation involves many different things, but most significantly doing exactly what God commanded Israel to do way back in Egypt, which was to cleanse our houses of all leaven, anything with yeast in it. So, of course, today that means that all your Wonder Bread, all your Dunkin' Donuts, all your bagels have to go. But because Passover occurs during the springtime, it's a time for a general house cleaning. And in the Orthodox Jewish home, mom will begin weeks in advance cleaning everything from floor to ceiling. There's even a whole new set of dishes put out for use at Passover. But we have a problem. And the problem is that although it is the mother of the house that does the cleaning, the rabbis tell us only the man could certify that the house has been properly cleaned. You can see what kind of a problem we have. The rabbis knew that the men would be hard pressed to get the job done right by themselves. And they wanted to ensure peace and harmony in the home at Passover. So they got together and they thought about this problem and they thought about it and they came up with a solution which in Hebrew is called bedikat chametz or the searching out of the leaven. Here's how it works. The night before Passover, mom already having cleaned the house of all leaven will take a little bit of crumbs from the toast they had for breakfast that morning, something with yeast in it, and she will come and hide it somewhere in the house. Now, the father, coming home that evening, will take in his hand a feather, a wooden spoon, and a napkin. And he'll go on a GI inspection to search out the leaven, looking high and looking low for those crumbs. Now, if his wife has been good enough to him, she's hid it in the same place she hid it last year, and the year before that, and the year before that, so that when he finally finds the crumbs, he takes the feather, and with his steady hand, he scrapes the crumbs into the spoon. Ladies, this is what I call heavy house cleaning. And he wraps the whole thing up in the napkin, and then... In religious communities, they still march off to the local synagogue where there's a bonfire burning in the courtyard. He takes the package, tosses it into the bonfire, recites a prayer, and so declares the house now properly cleaned. (laughs) Genius way for the men to get out of the house cleaning, right? Well, you know, there's a very specific analogy that Paul draws on on this uh, subject of Bedikat Chametz in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, And beginning with verse 6, Paul says, Your glorying is not good. Know ye not that a little leaven leavens the whole lump? Purge out therefore the old leaven, that ye may be a new lump as you are unleavened. For even Christ, our Passover, has been sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast, not with old leaven, neither with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. And so we see from that passage that leaven is not just something with yeast in it. In the Bible, it is a symbol for sin. And likewise, Paul points out then that the unleavened bread, this matzah, which we eat at Passover, is a symbol of purity and of righteousness before God. Now, ladies, I know you must be thinking it's unfair that you have to do all the hard work cleaning houts and the man gets all the ceremonial glory declaring it clean. Well, ladies, you have your very own bit of ceremonial glory called the brachut haner, the lighting of the festival candles, which actually ushers in the celebration of Passover. And at this time, mom will take this book, which is called Haggadah. 
Haggadah is a Hebrew word. It means the story or the telling. Within this beautifully bound, beautifully illustrated book, you find all of the prayers, ceremony, and story connected with the celebration of the Passover. So mom takes the Haggadah, and she says a special prayer in Hebrew as we light the candles. Now I have the English prayer in this brochure. So once I recite the Hebrew, ladies, would you join me in reciting the English. If you don't have a brochure, you can raise your hand and I shall get you one. Here's that blessing. Baruch atah Adonai Eloheinu melech haolam Asher kitshanu po mitzvotav V'tzivanu lahadlik ner Shel yom tov Amen Ladies, together in English. Blessed art thou, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who sanctifies us by his commandments and commands us to kindle the festival lights. Now I think it's appropriate that it is the woman rather than the man who lights the candles and so brings light to the festival table because in the same way it was not through a man but through a woman and the will of God that the light of the world came into the world. As the prophet Isaiah declared, Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and you will call his name Emmanuel, a light to lighten the Gentiles and the glory of my people Israel. And at this time, our Passover celebration can begin. Now, Passover occurs largely in the home around the family dinner table. And you'll notice there are pillows on the chairs, and these are symbols of our freedom. During the first Passover, as we read in Exodus 12, God commanded us to eat standing up. Only free people can recline at meal. We had to eat standing up because we were slaves at the time. We had to have our loins girded, our shoes on our feet, our staves in our hands, ready to take off at a moment's notice. Since then, we've been freed from bondage, and so we can recline on pillows as a symbol of that freedom. One other thing is sometimes Passover can take anywhere from four to six hours to complete. So having a pillow underneath you is not a bad thing. Don't worry, we're going to go through it quite a bit quicker here today. (laughs) So having that uh, family feeling, it's uh, the, the father has a special role to play. He puts on this kittle, which is symbolic of the ancient priestly garment that he ministered in in the temple because the father is priest of his home he wears this mitre which is symbolizing a crown from the ancient near east he's king of his castle mothers fathers children participate and the most significant way is through what's called the manish tana four questions are chanted usually by the youngest child, the answer to which gives the opportunity to retell the story of Passover. So I'm going to chant the first question that the child asks in Hebrew, and then I'll invite you all to join me in reading those four questions. Which means... Why is this night different from all other nights? On all other nights we eat leavened or unleavened bread. Why on this night do we eat only unleavened bread? Question two. On all other nights we eat vegetables and herbs of all kinds. Why on this night do we eat only bitter herbs? On all other nights we are not required to dip the herbs once. Why on this night do we dip them twice? On all other nights we eat seating upright or reclining. Why on this night do we recline? And so having read the four questions, the father then responds to answer with the magi, that is the retelling of the story of the Passover. And from door to door, from generation to generation, Passover is transmitted to the young folks. That's the purpose. Just as there are four questions which unpack the meaning of Passover, so you can see here there are four cups which actually outline the service of the Passover itself. Now, each cup has a special name given to it, and the first cup is called Kiddush, which literally means made holy, sanctification. 
And so there's a traditional Hebrew prayer that we say over this first cup. Certainly Jesus himself said that prayer. And then our Lord said something directly related to that Hebrew prayer. Baruch atah Adonai Eloheinu melech haolam Borei puri hagafen Amen. Now together in English. Over the Kiddush cup. Blessed art thou, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who creates the fruit of the vine. And then Jesus said, It is with great desire that I have desired to eat this Passover with you. But I tell you truly, I will not partake of the fruit of the vine again until I drink it anew in the kingdom. So with this cup, Jesus recognized that this was not just about that, but about a coming kingdom as well. And now everything is sanctified and blessed. Everything has a particular order to it as well. Now, Seder is the Hebrew word for order. Passover is referred to as a Seder meal. And this is a Seder plate. And despite its appearance, it's not for deviled eggs. You notice the compartments on the Seder plate correspond to the food items uh, down through here. A little bit of each is placed on the plate. And this is carpus, which is greens, in this case, parsley. And the rabbis tell us that, that the greens represent life. And we will take some salt water, which represent the tears of life. We dip the greens into the salt water. And so we are reminded that during our slavery, our lives were immersed in tears. A life without redemption is a life immersed in tears. But we also remember that God redeemed us. With a mighty outstretched arm, he brought us out of bondage through that salty Red Sea and into freedom. And so by his mercy and by his grace, our lives have been drawn from tears. We eat the greens to remind us now that we partake of life redeemed from tears by God's mercy and grace. The next item on the Seder plate, oh, horseradish. <laughs> We call it Jewish Dristan. <sighs> Guaranteed to unclog the sinus passages in the back of your head. Now the horseradish or maror as it's called in Hebrew is the very bitter herb that we were instructed to, to eat in, in Exodus 12 verse 5. And you'll remember when Jesus celebrated the Passover, he also had this with him. Now what we do is we take some of the unleavened bread and we say the blessing over it. Baruch atah Adonai Eloheinu melech haolam hamotzi lechem min haaretz. Amen. Together in English. Blessed art thou, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who brings forth bread from the earth. And then we take and we dip it into the bread, into the horseradish, and we get a teaspoon of it on there like this. And then... I'm not going to do it. <laughs> you know what happens when you eat this much horseradish? You begin to cry. <laughs> you have very little choice in the matter. But the tears that we shed are a graphic reminder of the tears our forefathers shed during their slavery in Egypt. Recall when Jesus celebrated the Passover, he said to them, one of you is going to betray me. And the disciples got all upset. They said, Lord, is it I? Is it I? Jesus said, the one who dips with me in the sop, that one will betray me. Well, isn't that interesting? Because all of the disciples dipped in the sop with the Jesus that night. Every single one of them. And think about it. Which one of them didn't betray him? Hmm? Even Peter, who said, oh, no, Lord, I'll never betray you. He, he, he denied him three times. <laughs> three times. The Bible says of Peter that he followed the Lord, yes, while the others ran away, he followed, but he followed at a distance. Sometimes I've followed the Lord, but at a distance. Never leads to good things, does it? But later that night in the upper room, Jesus once again takes the bread. He dips it the second time in the sop. Handing it to Judas Iscariot, he said to him, what you must do, go, do quickly. And the Bible tells us that Judas took the bread with the sop and Satan entered into him and he went out into the night. My roar is bitterness and tears. 
The next item on the Seder plate is Haroseth. Can y'all say that? Haroseth. Not bad, but you do have to get the get the in there, you know. Yeah, that's right. Just don't look at your neighbor when you say it, all right? <laughs> Haroseth is a sweet mixture. It's got chopped up apples and nuts and honey and cinnamon. It's delicious. But it represents the mortar that we used to make bricks for Pharaoh during our slavery in Egypt. It kind of looks like mortar. And so you might ask the rabbi, well, now, wait a minute, rabbi. If Haroseth represents mortar for bricks, why is this stuff so sweet? Ah, the rabbi will say, because you see, even the bitterest of our toils grew sweet when we knew that our redemption drew near. And we take... And we maybe get a double portion of this stuff on the matzah. And we eat it. And you know what happens? That bitter taste left in our mouths from the horseradish just disappears in the sweetness of the chorosis. Which reminds us that even the bitter things that we have to face in this world, including pandemics, even the bitter things can be sweetened by the hope that we have, the promise of God's redemption. This is Hazaret, the bitter root, a horseradish root. But if you don't have one of those, an onion will suffice because this is merely symbolic of the fact that not only are the experiences of life bitter, they are because the root of life is bitter. And that was certainly the experience of the children of Israel in Egypt and it's ours as well. The root of life is bitter. But if anyone is in Christ, what? It's a new creature. Praise the Lord. Now, these last two items are the only two not present when Jesus celebrated Passover with his disciples. You'll understand why. This is Hagiga. Hagiga is a hard-boiled egg, a brown hard-boiled egg. But Hagiga was actually the name given to the sacrifice made in the temple at Passover. So this egg represents that sacrifice. Now, we peel the egg, we slice it. Before we eat the slice, we dip it into the salt water, which represents tears. That's right, because we're mourning the fact that this represents a sacrifice that can no longer occur. That sacrifice took place in the temple at Passover. Jesus walked by that second temple and he said, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. He was speaking... First of all, of his death, burial, and resurrection, in which the sacrifices were fulfilled. But he also was pointing to the fact that not a generation after his death, burial, and resurrection, the temple would be no more. And that's exactly what happened. In 70 AD, Titus and his Roman legions marched into the city of Jerusalem, destroying the city, destroying the temple. And from that day until the present, you only have the outer retaining wall, the western wall, the wailing wall of the temple. And so my people mourn the loss of the sacrifice. In fact, because of that, we're told not to eat lamb anymore at Passover. That which was so central to that first Passover in Egypt is sadly absent. And we have this last symbol, Zeroah, which is the shank bone of a lamb, reminding us of those lambs that we needed in Egypt, but are now absent. God commanded that we take a yearling male lamb without spot, without blemish, without any broken bone. We were to take that lamb and sacrifice it. And this reminds me of another perfect Passover lamb who contrary to Roman custom did not have his legs broken when he hung on the cross. And so did Jesus fulfill that type and prophecy. We come now to the second cup, which is called the cup of plagues. And we don't drink from this cup right away, but rather dip our finger into the cup and drop a drop of wine on the plate in front of us. Each drop symbolizes one of the ten plagues. We remember the blood, hail, locusts, boils, cattle disease, darkness, death. Nine times Pharaoh hardened his heart. Each time God sent a plague on the land of Egypt. But the tenth plague was the worst of all, the death of the firstborn. Now God told the children of Israel to take the blood of that sacrificed lamb in a basin, 
to go outside of their homes and apply it to their doorposts, putting on the lintel and the two side posts. Blood of the lamb, two side posts. Blood of the lamb, two side posts. Making the sign of a cross with the blood of the lamb on that doorpost. That night death flew through the land of Egypt. There was weeping and wailing as never before till Pharaoh cried out, let them go, let them go or I'll die. But everywhere that the blood of the lamb was on the top lintel and the two side posts, death passed over that house. And so redemption came that night to the children of Israel in the land of Egypt. Now because I believe in Jesus as my Messiah, and because I have by faith applied the blood of his sacrifice to the doorpost of my heart, when death comes to visit me, death is going to pass over me also because I have eternal life. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Isn't that good? Wow. Praise the Lord. This is called a matzotash. A matzah tosh. You know matzah being the unleavened bread, tosh meaning bag. That's what this is. It's a bag, a pouch for unleavened bread. In fact, there are three pieces of unleavened bread inside the matzah tosh, leading the rabbis to assert that the matzah tosh represents a unity. Three pieces of bread, one bag. Three in one. And yet there's a great deal of disagreement among the rabbis as to which unity this matzotash represents. Writing in the Haggadah, one rabbi says it represents the unity of the patriarchs. You know, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Another says no, it represents the unity of worship in Israel, the priests, the Levites, and the people. And on go several more explanations. Well, I believe the matzotash represents a unity also. But I believe the matzotash represents the unity of our triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And here's why. During a particular time of Passover, we will reach into the second or middle compartment. Now you'll ask the rabbi, Rabbi, why do we take the second piece and leave the first and third pieces hidden? And the answer is, we don't know. <laughs> it's tradition. <laughs> Taking out this second piece from the middle compartment of the matzotash, we call it the bread of affliction. And there are three things you need to notice about this bread. First of all, it's flat, right? It's a cracker. It's no leavening. We've talked about that. And in fact, we're so eager to make sure this is unleavened bread. There's no rising in the bread that when we roll out the dough, we use a device to poke holes in the bread. You can see the flame of the candle through the bread because the bread is pierced. It's pierced. And these brown stripes bake on the bread. It is unleavened. It is striped. It is pierced. We take the second piece from the middle compartment of the matzotash and we break it in half. Taking this broken piece, we now wrap it in a linen cloth or in a linen bag and call it afikomen, a word meaning it comes later. And that's exactly what happens. This broken piece wrapped in a linen cloth is carried outside of the room of celebration to be hid for a time, buried if you will. And this is such an important part of the Passover. The entire celebration cannot be completed without that second piece. And we'll get back to that in just a minute. But I'm curious, how many of you have never been to a Passover before? Wow, the majority of you have never been. If you should have the opportunity to go, let me encourage you to take it. But let me also warn you, if you're going to go to a Passover Eat lightly that day or not at all, because you are really in for a meal. I want to assure you that Passover is much more than parsley and horseradish. We eat and we eat and we eat. Unfortunately, that's the part of the Passover I forgot to bring with me here today. (laughs) 
And in lieu of that sumptuous meal, I'm going to lead you through another ceremony, a tradition connected to this brochure that you should have received. And if you'll notice, the third panel is separated from the others by a perforation. So the ceremony begins by folding it along that perforation towards you and away from you. The ceremony is called the ceremonial tearing of the card at the count of three. It's a very ancient tradition. And just to show you how much Jewish culture you've absorbed, I'm counting to three in Hebrew, and amazingly, you'll know when to rip, okay? So here comes the count. Echad, shtaim, shalosh. Wonderful. Now, unless you're especially creative, you should only have two pieces in your hand. The larger section is for you to keep. The smaller section, if you look at it, there's a place for your name and address. If you begin filling this out right now, I wouldn't think it rude if you write while I speak. And as you leave, at the end of the service, there's a basket for you to drop this uh, in. And if you do, we'll send you our free monthly newsletter from Jews for Jesus, which will tell you more about what God is doing around the world and seeing Jewish people coming to believe in Jesus. Now, I have a video that will tell you just a little bit about the ministry of Jews for Jesus as you're filling that out. So let's go ahead and roll that video. <clears throat> Shalom from Israel. At Jews for Jesus, we have three distinct ways that we reach people with the love of the Messiah Jesus by proclaiming the gospel to communities that may otherwise never hear it, by inviting people to come and see what it looks like to be Jewish and believe in Jesus, and by following the Messiah's example by loving and serving isolated and impoverished Jewish communities. In Israel, less than half a percent of Jewish people know Jesus as their Messiah. Together, we're working to change that reality one person at a time. This year, we knew we couldn't allow the challenges of the pandemic to prevent us from reaching those in need of the life-changing message of the gospel. So we adapted our methods, and what we saw God do was incredible. Since we couldn't proclaim the gospel message on college campuses, at public events, or on the streets, we took it online. In Israel, for every 100 people, there are 122 computers, the highest person-to-computer ratio in the world. Israelis also spend more time on Facebook and YouTube than any other country does. In lockdown, this trend has only increased. In just a few months, the videos our new media team created were viewed by Israelis over a half a million times. Thousands of gospel seeds have been planted. Pray with us that God will cause them to grow and that they bear fruit. With social distancing restrictions, limiting attendance at our evangelistic events, we went outdoors. We sent a team to the local Israel Nation Trail to share the gospel. In just a few short weeks, our team was able to share from the gospel with 645 Israelis and give out 19 Hebrew New Testaments. Praise God. Pray with us for these Israelis, many of whom are young and disillusioned with traditional Judaism, that they might come to see that Yeshua is the truth they're searching for. The last way that we reach the people of Israel with the gospel is by loving and serving those in need. God used the pandemic restrictions to provide new opportunities to serve. It is estimated that there are 25,000 people who are homeless in Israel, and social services are equipped to serve under 10% of them. Tel Aviv hosts the largest concentration of homeless people in the country. With soup kitchens shut down and many shelters at full capacity, the threat of coronavirus is compounded by the threat of people on the street dying of malnutrition and weakened immune systems. When shelter in place started, it felt like we were out of options. But God gave us a new idea. If people couldn't come to the soup kitchen, we could bring the soup kitchen to them. A food truck would allow us to serve more people in need. Our ministry partners jumped in to help, and in just a few months, we got the truck fully operational. We now serve 180 people every week, providing them meals and fresh water, and sharing with them the message of living water that can be found in knowing the Lord. Stand with us in prayer for those in Israel who are in desperate need of help and of hope. The salvation of this entire world is connected to the salvation of Israel. The story of redemption that God has been staging since the beginning of human history will not be complete until His plans for the Jewish people are fulfilled. We can't stop proclaiming the gospel in the land of Israel until we see God's promises fulfilled. These efforts, these stories of hope, would not be possible without you. 
You can make an eternal impact today with your continued generosity and prayers. Let's continue to lift up the name of Yeshua, our Messiah, in His holy land of Israel together to learn how you can partner with us further in pursuing God's plan of salvation for the Jewish people. You can partner with us by filling this card out and dropping it in the basket as you go. I'm excited to tell you that even during the pandemic, we were able to open up a brand new branch of Jews for Jesus in Jerusalem. And so as an addition, yeah, praise the Lord. <laughs> as, a, as an additional resource, we'd like to provide you with a map that has on one side of it what Jerusalem looked like during the times of Jesus with different mar markings on the map where Jesus did his miracles in the city of Jerusalem. You flip the map to the other side and it's what modern Jerusalem looks like and where different testimonies of people who came to faith in Jesus occurred through our ministry on the streets of Jerusalem. And so I think it'll be a great tool for you and also a helpful prayer guide. So fill this card out, drop it as as you go in the back there's an opportunity for you to give and if you give in that offering it will go in its entirety to the new work of Jews for Jesus in Jerusalem. We've come through the meal of Passover over now and I hope you've all had enough to eat because this last part of the Seder is the most important for we as followers of Jesus to understand. Towards the end of the meal, the head of the house will say to all the children, go search for the afikomen. Now remember, that's that broken piece that was wrapped in a linen cloth and hidden for a time. The kids didn't see where it was hidden. So they get to get up and run around the house looking for it because the child who finds it, the child who finds it gets a reward for finding that second piece. And the head of the house stands and continues the ancient ceremony of the Matsutash and Afikomen by breaking off small pieces and giving to everyone seated at the table. Everyone receives a piece of this bread. Now, does that remind you of anything? <laughs> you see, brothers and sisters, if, if the Matsutash represents the unity of the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, why is the middle piece broken, buried, and brought back? If the matzah represents the unity of worship, the Levites, the priests, and the people, why is the middle piece broken, buried, and brought back? But if the matzah represents the unity of our triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, then we know why. It's because Jesus, the second person of the Trinity, was broken in death, wrapped in a linen cloth, buried in the tomb, and then brought back, resurrected by the power of God. Hallelujah. Conquering sin, conquering death, so that it is no wonder that Jesus took this very bread and broke it and gave to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Amazing, huh? And then he took the cup. Well, now you know, we take the cup four times during Passover. So which time was it? Well, the Gospels, the Scriptures record that Jesus took the cup after they had supped. So we have the first two cups, then the meal, and the cup that comes right after the meal is the third cup, and the third cup is the cup of Gula, the cup of redemption. Looking back to the redemption God brought our forefathers from Egypt, but also looking forward to that redemption in Moshiach, when the Messiah comes and Jesus now, at the very high point of this Passover, takes the bread, takes the cup, says, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. New covenant, Habrit HaChadashah. Only one place in the entire Hebrew Bible those words are used. Jeremiah chapter 31, beginning with verse 31. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make Habrit HaChadashah, a new covenant with the house of Israel, with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, my covenant which they break. Although I was a husband to them, saith the Lord. It was a broken covenant. The Mosaic Constitution was a broken covenant. 
But this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law in their inward parts and on their hearts I will write it. First covenant was written on tablets of stone. New covenant was to be written on the tablet of our hearts. And I will be their God and they shall be my people, says the Lord, for I will forgive their sin and remember their iniquity no more. Oh, this was the ultimate condition. Daily offerings of animals in the temple were the means by which Israel experienced atonement. But one day, one day, one day, Jeremiah said, God's going to make it once and for all. And Jesus, the Lamb of God, did that. Take, drink of it all. This is my blood in the new covenant. Oh, what an amazing thing that God has redeemed his people. The bread and the cup are the fulfillment of this Passover. And all around the world, people will conclude this celebration by a great hymn fest. You know, the scriptures say, let the redeemed of the Lord say so, right? And so we have to now give thanks and praise to God for this redemption. And we do so by singing from the Jewish national hymnal, which is the Psalms, Israel's hymnal. Psalms 113 through 118 are sung at this time. Some of the words of it are in the brochure for you to see Psalm 118 declared the stone which the builders rejected has now become the chief cornerstone. Imagine Jesus singing this in the upper room knowing that it spoke of him, knowing what he was about to face. And nevertheless, the, the, the scriptures record that they sang a hymn and that would have been the hymn they were singing, the great Hallel, Psalm 118. They sang the hymn and then they went out to the Mount of Olives. But before they left, they would have taken the cup one more time, the fourth cup, which is Hallel, you know, Hallelujah. Praise the Lord, Hallel, the cup of praise taken together with hymns of praise. And all over the world on the Saturday before Palm Sunday, Jewish people will conclude their Passover, raising up this cup and saying, Lashana haba Berushalayim, next year in Jerusalem. Because this Passover not only looks back to a time in the past, but looks forward with the final coming of the Messiah, the redemption that has been promised to us. And therein lies the burden of my heart and of Jews for Jesus. So many raising this cup up, declaring that and looking forward to that which has already happened. Waiting for a Messiah who's already come. And most of my people have never seen what you've seen here today. So it's my hope and my prayer that in your seeing that beautiful heritage that is yours in the Messiah, that you will not only be enriched in your understanding of God's word, but that you would help us carry this burden with us. That you would pray for your Jewish friends to come to know the Messiah. That you would speak to them of the fulfillment of the Messiah in the Passover. And that they would join you in worshiping the king. Oh, they're waiting Many of them are waiting. In fact, there's a tradition that at Passover, Elijah the prophet will come and tell us Messiah is on his way, just like Malachi said he would, the forerunner. And so there's this cup here. This is Elijah's cup. Nobody, nobody sits there, but at a particular time, the head of the house says to the youngest child, go and open the door. Let's see if Elijah comes to our Passover Seder. As the door is open, we stand to greet him and we say, Baruch haba b'shem Adonai. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And then we sing, Eliyahu Hanavi. Eliyahu ha tishbi, Eliyahu, Eliyahu, Eliyahu ha giladi. Elijah the prophet, Elijah the Tishbite, Elijah the Gileadite, come and bring with you Messiah, son of David. And every year my people stand, and every year they sing, and every year they wonder, is he ever going to come? Still waiting. They don't know of that one named Yochanan. You know him as John. The baptizer, who one day seeing a Jewish man coming up over the hill, declared, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. He was the forerunner. Jesus said it. If you care to receive it, John is Elijah. And they don't know of Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus, the Messiah. May they come to know him. That's what we're all about. And we know that it's going to happen. <laughs> We know it's going to happen. The Bible promises that he's going to, they're going to look upon him whom they have pierced and mourn. 
as one mourns for an only son. And in that day, a great fountain will be opened in Jerusalem for cleansing. And all Israel will be saved. But while he tarries, individual Jews need Jesus just like everybody else. And that's my burden to share with you today. Uh, We are not like those of my people who do not know him and therefore wait uncertain. We wait with great confidence. For the Bible teaches as long as you eat this bread, as long as you drink this cup, you show forth the Lord's death until he come again. Maranatha, even so, come quickly, Lord Jesus. Amen. Amen. That ain't bad, is it? <laughs> what do you think, an Italian and a Jew on the same stage? <laughs> Boy, the guilt. <laughs> That's awesome. Do you see how faithful God is? Do you see that thread? Now, there's a couple of challenges, a few challenges for us. Number one, maybe you're one of those Christians who, hey, I love the Bible, but you spend most of your time in the New Testament. Uh, you know, the Old Testament's bigger. And in my experience as a pastor, far too many of us, we know the Psalms and we know the Proverbs, but the Old Testament's just rich when you understand it from that perspective. Jesus said to the religious leaders of his day, you search the scriptures. That's the Old Testament. You search the scriptures because you believe that in them you have eternal life. It is these that testify of me. But you are unwilling to come to me and have life. Don't let that be true of you. Where are your friends? Secondly, we're going to do exactly what David asked us to do, and that is to pray for them. But before I do, I want to point out that on your way out, both at the back and here, you're going to see a basket. And that's provided so that if you want to write a check, you would make it payable to Jews for Jesus. Um, It would be a way for us to participate in in a fresh way financially. It could be a check. It could be cash. Make it American. Um, uh, You can do that on your way out the back or here. Please give some thought to how you could do that. Uh, I'm going to pray, and then I'm going to ask David then to come and to bless us uh, in accordance with the scriptures. So um, would you bow your heads, please? We're going to pray for this ministry. Heavenly Father, thank you for the picture of your faithfulness of the reality to which Jesus referred when he said that the scriptures of the Old Testament testify of him. Father, thank you for all of us who have come to him to find the eternal life that we might search for in the scriptures but only find in the one to whom the scriptures point. Father, I praise you that Jesus gave his life for us to give his life to us and is ready to live his life through us as us that we can trust you to do that, Lord Jesus. I pray today for the Jews for Jesus ministry that you would uh, take the loaves and fish of what they have already possessed and done and multiply it exceedingly abundantly above anything they and we could ever ask or imagine and to do so in such a way that it glorifies the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you for David. Bless him, the ministry, his family, his travel as he heads to Alabama. We thank you for our time together. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. David, would you come? Yes, thank you. It's been great to be here with you. I look forward to coming back sometime soon. Would you all please stand? In Numbers chapter 6, God gave the sons of Aaron, the priests, a special blessing. He said, bless my people with this blessing, and they will be blessed. First in Hebrew, then in English, they will be dismissed. Would you bow your heads, please? Yivarechecha Adonai vayishmarecha Yoher Adonai panavalacha vikuneika Yisau Adonai panavalecha V'yoseim lecha Shalom. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and grant you his peace. 
בשם ישוע משיחנו שר השלום. In the name of Jesus.